Okay, um, can you pass the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's on the end of it. I, I guess I don't need it. <laughs> By the way, uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, I just rushed in. I was over to Akronu this afternoon interviewing potential teachers. And Caesar Akronu has changed a lot over the last 30 years. I don't know if you've been over there. <laughs> you wouldn't, believe me. Uh, it took me a long way home. Wolf's Ledges doesn't even exist anymore. They completely took out that exit ramp, so that really threw me for a loop. But anyway, welcome tonight. Um, we do have a program coming up on Wadsworth's role in, during the Civil War, or what life was like, and not too many people are around today that lived during Don't the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> Norman's the only one that can <laughs> do that. But anyway, there's not a whole lot happened over the last month. I can tell you we continue to be busy over at the museum. Uh, I do get lots of requests for pictures and things, and I try to accommodate people uh, as much as I can. I just look them up. Um, I do have 23,000 pictures of Wadsworth uh, digitally stored and Pretty much all I have to do is put in a keyword and it pops up and I can shoot it out during email and uh, it works out nicely. And thanks to Caesar for writing up the history of the Weldy House that just came tumbling down a couple of weeks ago and now it's nothing more than a brown space, I guess I call it at this point in time. And uh, that family was on my paper out when I was a kid. I delivered newspapers there and I remember Mr. Weldy just sitting on the porch all the time and waiting for his newspaper and I would open up the screened in door and hand it to him during the summertime. And he was a man of few words. I don't think he ever said two words to me. But his daughter always paid me monthly and I was happy and that was great. So thank you Caesar for your insights there. Um, again, for those just uh, update on April 1st, we're having a regional local history muse uh, museum uh, conference that's going to be at Grace Lutheran Church. And this region encompasses like five counties in the area. So we're hosting it again over at the Lutheran Church. Afterwards, they'll be taking tours of the museum. And it's just, um, this is an opportunity for local historical societies to come together and share plans and also to ask questions on how we can make things better. And they all run into similar situations and that is how to get people out to their museums. So that's gonna be one of the big discussions that day on ideas on getting, getting people out to their museums and how to um, use the media to do that. And if you're out and about on Saturday, March 25th, Franklin School has its uh, annual French toast maple syrup breakfast, and we're making maple syrup this week. And I told the kids today, when they went back to the trees to gather them up, I said, now make sure you keep a hold of the jugs. It's windy out. <laughs> Next thing I look out, there's a kid halfway across Bird Street Park running after one of the, the five-gallon empty buckets. So uh, they learned a lot about air pressure. And <laughs> so it's all about education. Um, our... Treasurer's report, I'll just briefly give it, and that we have $66,000 in the bank. So uh, we're in great shape, and we continue to get money in all the time. We can't spend it fast enough. But uh, we're very frugal in what we do spend it on, and everything's uh, things that are badly needed. We Now that we have a lot of the lighting replaced, and uh, we're looking at getting some insulation in the, the attic, and uh, possibly looking at doing something with the windows because they're getting in pretty bad shape. That house was built in 1852, so it's needy. But uh, if you walk into it, you wouldn't recognize the need because uh, we're doing a nice job in keeping it updated. So um, again, if you're not a member of the Wadsworth Area Historical Society, become a member. It's the cheapest, not cheapest, but the least expensive club in town. It's $10 or $8 depending on your uh, age bracket for a year. You can't beat that. Uh, and I do know that the River Sticks is meeting this Saturday night. This Saturday Tom, night. you may want to talk about that. We're going to be doing a, a life history of Ruby Razor. 
Tom Meyer did a, a, a program a year ago, and Cesar Cuneo did the life history of Ruby uh, at her 93rd birthday. So we're going to be playing both of those uh, Saturday night at 6.30. Oh, you're just showing that, or is she going to be there? No, we're She'll be there, gonna be there. Susan's mom. Suzanne's going to bring her. Okay. So it's like part three. It's part three. <laughs> All right, so that's at the Guilford Grange Hall. Starts at 6. Ruby Grange is 93? 94. Now she's she's 95. 95. She will be 95. Born 1922. Yeah, he's taken outside after this. <laughs> 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 and don't get Ruby involved or she'll whoop both of them. <laughs> 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 a picture of them. <laughs> so um, anyway, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Norman. Unless anybody has a question for me. Um, Tom, unfortunately, Tom can't make some of our board meetings. We set it before he uh, set the meetings before he could respond to say he wasn't available those nights. So we're going to get him back on track uh, once we get through May and work on next year's calendar. So again, without further ado, we will have our program here. Norman Bragg. Uh, Thank you. Many of you know him, I believe. <laughs> He's another person that doesn't need a microphone. <laughs> To the generation of Northerners who fought and won it, it was known as the War of the Rebellion. To people in the South, it has often been known as the War Between the States or the War for Southern Independence. In his Gettysburg Address, Abraham Lincoln referred to it as a civil war, and that is the name that has become most enduring. It was a time when great American armies marched through America's own land, burned America's own cities, and fought in epic battles. Between 1861 and 1865, over three million men served in the armies of North and South, and over 600,000 of them died while in military service. It was the great central experience of the American nation. Even today, many of us still think often of our own family's involvement in the war and the stories about it that we have heard from childhood. Its memories still stir great controversy in this nation, as evidenced by the continuing controversy about the display of the Confederate flag. Literally thousands of books have been written about it, discussing a wide multitude of aspects of the war in meticulous detail. Today I want to share with you what I have learned about what Wadsworth was like during the war and how the war affected Wadsworth. Let us begin by looking at Wadsworth as the war approached. When the Civil War began in 1861, Wadsworth Township had been settled for 47 years. The earliest settlers who came to Wadsworth Township were a combination of transplanted New Englanders and Pennsylvania Dutch. The Pennsylvania Dutch, of course, were the descendants of German Protestants who had settled in Pennsylvania in colonial times. By 1861, most of the transplanted New Englanders and their descendants had moved farther west, and many of their farms had been taken over by Pennsylvania Dutch families. The 1860 census showed a population of 1,703 people in 320 households in Wadsworth Township. The township was very much still a farming community, and the village of Wadsworth had not yet been incorporated. It was notable that 565 of the people had been born in the state of Pennsylvania, and only 32 had been born in Connecticut, even though Wadsworth Township had been included in the Connecticut Western Reserve. It was also very noteworthy 
that there was only one resident who had been born in a slave state. That person had been born in the state of Virginia. However, everyone else in that person's family had been born in Pennsylvania. It is unlikely that there was any sympathy at all in Wadsworth for the secession of the southern states. When the Civil War began with the Confederate attack on Fort Stumpter, Wadsworth and Medina County reacted quickly. A mass meeting was held in Medina nine days after the fall of Fort Sumter. An old history book published in 1881 contains an account of that meeting in Medina, and I will read an excerpt from the book. A mass meeting was immediately called to be held at Medina on Tuesday, the 23rd of April, 1861, nine days after the fall of Sumter, for the purpose of securing volunteers for the service and learning the will of the people. Almost the entire county turned out, men, women, and children, and great excitement and invincible determinations of loyalty prevailed. Bands of martial music paraded the streets for hours before the appointed time for speaking arrived. E.A. Warner was chosen president of the day, and immediately thereafter, the following resolutions were offered by the Honorable Herman Canfield. Whereas a portion of the states of this nation have without just cause renounced their allegiance to the federal government, and by formal acts of traitorous conventions declared their secession from the Union, and have seized the forts, arsenals, and other property of the United States within their state limits, and emboldened by temporary success, are now marching upon the federal capital to subvert the government and attempt the subjugation of the loyal states. Therefore be it resolved that we regard secession as treason and the pretended government of the so-called Confederate states as an organized rebellion. Resolve that we make no compromise with traitors nor terms with rebels in arms. Resolve that we will bury all party differences and forget all party distinctions until our beloved country is rescued from its peril and the supremacy of the laws vindicated. Resolved that by the help of God, we will transmit to our posterity the glorious republic, the free constitution, and the priceless liberties we inherited from a brave ancestry. Resolved that this convention appeal to the trustees of the several townships to procure the immediate organization and drill of military companies, and that this convention appoint township committees of five to cooperate with the trustees in said object. Resolved that the committees so appointed take prompt and efficient measures for the support of the families of the volunteers who go out to their country's battles, and we hereby pledge the utmost of our means for that purpose. After the meeting, a number of local men enlisted to serve in the Union Army. These men were taken to Cleveland by wagon and from there by railroad to Columbus, and they later became part of the 8th Ohio Volunteer Infantry Regiment. This regiment served in the Army of the Potomac and was at several of the most famous battles of the war, including the Battle of Gettysburg, where it formed part of what was called the Gibraltar Brigade. Another regiment formed later in the war, which included many Wadsworth residents, was the 42nd Ohio Volunteer Infantry Regiment. It was initially led by James Garfield, then of Hiram, Ohio, who is said to have recruited soldiers in Wadsworth. James Garfield later became a Civil War general and served briefly as President of the United States before being assassinated in 1881. Like most Ohio regiments, the 42nd Ohio Volunteer Infantry Regiment included companies from several counties. 
counties which provided its companies included Ashland, Cuyahoga, Lorain, Medina, Miami, Noble, Portage, Shelby, and Summit. It served in Kentucky and Tennessee and was later at the Siege of Vicksburg. The cemetery monuments for several Civil War veterans buried in Woodlawn Cemetery in Wadsworth note that they served in the 42nd Ohio Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Of all the men who entered the Union Army from Wadsworth, the man who went on to the most distinguished career was Don Albert Pardee. He was the son of Aaron Pardee, Wadsworth's first lawyer, who many years later would become the first mayor of the village of Wadsworth. Don Pardee was born in 1837 in Wadsworth and as a young man contemplated a career as a Navy officer. He attended the United States Naval Academy for three years but resigned before graduation. He returned to Wadsworth and studied law in his father's law office. He was admitted to the Ohio Bar in 1859 and was practicing law when the Civil War began. He entered the Union Army as a major in the 44th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, but when James Garfield organized the 42nd Ohio Volunteer Infantry, he had Don Pardee transferred to it. It is said that Garfield wanted Pardee in his regiment because of Pardee's training at the Naval Academy. After distinguished service in the 42nd Ohio Volunteer Infantry Regiment, Don Pardee was mustered out of military service as a colonel in late 1864. Don's brother, George Pardee, also served as an officer in the 42nd Ohio Volunteer Infantry Regiment, and in 1994, the Summit County Historical Society published a book of letters that he wrote during the war to his wife in Wadsworth. The book is entitled, My Dear Carrie. After being mustered out of the Union Army, Don Pardee became a very successful lawyer in the city of New Orleans. He was elected as a state court judge in Louisiana, was a delegate to a state constitutional convention, and a candidate for attorney general of Louisiana. He continued to have a close friendship with his distinguished Civil War colleague, James Garfield. When James Garfield became President of the United States in 1881, he appointed Don Pardee as Judge of the Federal Circuit Court. And when the Federal Fifth Circuit Court was created in 1891, Don Pardee continued and became the Senior Judge of that court, which then was an intermediate Federal Appellate Court with jurisdiction over the states of Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. The only higher federal court was the Supreme Court of the United States. Don Pardee continued to serve as a judge of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals until his death in 1919. All during his many years as a federal judge in the South, Don Pardee continued to maintain a home in Wadsworth, to which he returned during the summers. It was located on what was then called Stony Ridge Road and is now called Rymer Road. He called his home Vacation Ridge. In later years, the road was straightened and now runs through a deep rock cut north of where Don Pardee's Vacation Ridge residence once stood. Don Pardee, despite his long judicial tenure in the South, is buried in Woodlawn Cemetery in Wadsworth. While many of its men were absent from the community serving in the Union Army, a very important event occurred in Wadsworth in the summer of 1863 when the railroad was built through Wadsworth. The completion of the railroad dramatically changed life in Wadsworth because it made it possible for the development of large coal mines and the population increased very rapidly. Within three years, the village of Wadsworth would be incorporated in the center of the township in 1866. 
After the Civil War, the memory of the war was kept alive in Wadsworth by the annual observance of Decoration Day, also called Memorial Day. In 1882, local veterans of the Union Army organized East Eaton Post Number 265 of the Grand Army of the Republic, the National Veterans Organization for Union Veterans of the Civil War. It was named for Corporal Jackson Eaton, a local man who served in the 8th Ohio Volunteer Infantry Regiment and who died of a wound received at the Battle of Antietam. In 1912, the Grand Army of the Republic promoted the erection of a monument with a statue to honor the Union soldiers of the Civil War. It once stood in downtown Wadsworth and now stands in Woodlawn Cemetery, where there is also an earlier obelisk monument erected to the memory of those who were killed in the Civil War. Thank you. I'm open to questions if anybody wants to ask any questions for a few minutes. I don't have a question. However, um, I worked for 30 years with John Pardee's great niece, Caroline Pardee, who was the last person of the Pardees to be buried here. And the book was written by um, George Nepper, Dr. George Nepper. And I was pl uh, pl pleased that she invited me to be at her home when the book was finally finished. She, uh, I understand, discovered this collection of letters which were involved her grandfather, George Pardee, who was the brother of Don Pardee. Any other questions? Or? Yes. Well, that's a question that people often ask throughout Ohio about different communities and the Underground Railroad. And, of course, the reality was that when the Underground Railroad was operating, it was very secretive, very, very secretive, because people could get in great trouble for being involved in the Underground Railroad, especially after the passage of the Second Fugitive Slave Act in 1850. Uh, so people were very, few, very secretive about it at the time. However, in later years, after the Civil War was over, of course, then it became a popular thing for people to claim that they had been associated with the Underground Railroad. So uh, it's kind of hard to know, you know, what is actually uh, factual about the Underground Railroad, uh, and a lot of it's kind of speculative. I think a lot of the more more activity on the Underground Railroad was closer to the slave states, where slaves would get across from either Virginia, which of course now is West Virginia, or, uh, or Kentucky. And of course the idea was to try to uh, uh, help the slaves get to Canada. And slavery was illegal in Canada and as part of the British Empire. And if slaves could get to Canada, then they didn't have to be concerned about being returned to the South under the Fugitive, Fugitive Slave Act. So, uh, but I don't know anything, you know, factual specific about Wadsworth, but there may be some stories as there are throughout Ohio about possible connections to the Underground Railroad. Okay. Well, I don't know precisely how many, and of course there'd be different ways to look at that. Uh, and that's true of, of all of our wars. One way would be to look at where they were living when they entered the army. And of course, there would have been many who entered the army from Wadsworth, but then after the war went on to live most of their lives someplace else. There were also many, many veterans of the Civil War who did not enter the army from Wadsworth, but after the war came to live in Wadsworth. And, of course, Wadsworth was a growing community after the war uh, with first the uh, coal mines and later, then a generation later with the factories. So there were, I know, many of them that 
were Civil War veterans, but they did not enter the service from Wadsworth, so you get into that question of whether you consider them Wadsworth uh, people in terms of their Civil War service. And you get into the same issue with all of the later wars, same thing with the Vietnam War and World War I and World War II, because people move around. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your attendance. And